Welcome everyone, my name is Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield with only Steel-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Steel-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except Hull items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or the final league member's ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. This Steel-type. An incredibly cool typing with tons of even cooler Pokemon demonstrating what it has to offer. Ever since its introduction in Gen 2, it's had a profound impact on the Pokemon world, and that has grown even stronger with the introduction of fairies in Gen 6, which gave it a further buff in a sense. Steel types on the whole have incredibly high attack and defense stats, but are quite slow as one might expect. I mean, they're made out of metal after all. Another problem is that they tend to have either weird or very late evolutions, making the early game quite a challenge in Nuzlocke's. With that said, if there's one thing Sword and Shield did right, it's Pokemon variety in the early game. So we have a ton of great Steel-type encounter possibilities available to us. With that said, some of the methods to find these can be quite difficult, so it'll be interesting to see what we manage to get. What's not difficult to get, though, is incredible and unique products from today's sponsor, Bespoke Post, a monthly membership club delivering awesome boxes of top-shelf goods from under-the-radar brands. Every month, members are introduced to cool new products, whether it's outdoor gear, barware, clothing, and much more based on a preference quiz that they fill out. And the box lineup consistently changes each month. They get 90% of their products straight from small businesses so you can feel great about what you get, including the forge that I got this month, a Damascus steel knife made by Buck and Bear Knives located right in Pennsylvania. I tend to open a lot of packages, and this thing is razor sharp and gets the job done with ease, being incredibly sturdy and looking really slick too. I ended up getting a few other boxes this month too, like the really clean looking Day Tripper Cooler with tons of space to take my favorite drinks on the go and keeps them cold for a really long time, along with a storable bottle opener too. Added to that, the Nightcap Box, featuring some incredible whiskey glasses that are super well made and have laser etched mountain models with Within them, along with some great leather coasters to set them on, a crossword book for some downtime, and also an amber and oak moss reed diffuser which has one of my favorite scents of all time. These are just some of the many examples of great boxes that have been in different month lineups, and you even have the option to preview, swap, or even skip a given month at no extra cost. Every box has $70 in retail value but only costs $49, so if you're looking for some unique products, I highly suggest browsing around their site. I've spent hours finding amazing things that you can't find anywhere else. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter code SILF20 at checkout, or go to www.bespokepost.com slash SILF20. Alright, let's get this journey underway. Say, Mr. Rose, you don't suppose you could lend me that demented looking elephant real quick, do you? We kinda need one of those. At our house, Hop comes in and starts yammering about who knows what, and <laughs> look at our character. He is not entertained. Going to check what the hell that banging outside is, we run into a Wulu that pretty much personifies what my life is like at the moment. I feel you, buddy. I feel you. Let's explore the neighborhood a little bit, shall we? Huh. So that's what Pokemon Champion money gets you. Speaking of which, the unbeatable champion himself comes to town, and... Sheesh. I always forget Charizard is only like 4'11". I never want to see one beside a human being ever again. Just completely distorts my viewpoint as a child. Moving on, we get to choose our starter Pokemon, none of which are Steel-type, so they don't really matter. Thinking, alright, let's pick Grookey, the starter this week, to score Bunny, which as a Fire-type would be most challenging for our Steel-types, but... I forgot that in this game, Hop actually picks the starter that's weak to yours. What an idiot. Regardless, we're gonna catch some Pokemon that can handle the score money line quite easily, so Sobble might actually pose the biggest challenge anyway. High five, little buddy! Yeah! We're gonna do... nothing together. Running through the mysterious slumbering world, we encounter the legendary Zamazenta, and I was so tired, I thought he just screamed, Garfield! That's his canon name from now on, I'm calling it. After witnessing a love story that rivals Romeo and Juliet, we get some Pokeballs, meaning our run has officially begun. Thankfully, our first encounter is available right on Route 1, a Rookity, which I catch and nickname Featherweight. Featherweight ends up having a hardy neutral nature, and technically doesn't get the Steel-type until his final evolution, but we're stuck using him until we can get an actual Steel-type soon. <coughs> oh, <j> <clears throat> Sorry, I just choked on my water, that's all. With our new encounter in hand, it's time to deposit Get in the Bag once and for all. I forgot that you don't get the remote PC in your bag until later, so my nickname was kind of all for naught. Sorry, Nebby. I let you down. 
As a quick picker-upper though, Wedgehurst actually has a guy who sells berries, like the Oran berries here, which is a great thing to pick up this early in game. Okay, there's no way we can continue our adventure looking like this, so... Ah, much better. Damn, we're looking clean out here. Visiting Magnolia's house, we head upstairs and... Uh, I... I shouldn't. As if that wasn't creepy enough on our behalf, let's sneak behind their damn house. Alright, it's not for what you think. There's a payback TM here, which I think will actually be great for us. On Route 2, Hop challenges us to battle, and at level 9, Featherweight had learned Hone Claws to raise our attack power, so I try to load up on those, but his Wulu starts using Growl, so I only got plus 1 on our attack before taking it down. Regardless, thanks to our Orenberry, we're able to take down his Sobble, and his own Rookity too, with good health remaining. A great start. Okay, Game Freak was just shameless here. The standard terrible plot device is something literally falling from the sky in the nick of time, and... yep. Our stupid Dynamax stones literally fall from the sky, which, to make the game harder, we won't even be using. What a plot sequence. In no time, we arrive at a crucial place, the wild area, where we're bound to find a steel type of some sort, right? Well, to start with, there's an onyx, but it's way too high of a level, so we can't catch it. I spent like an hour searching around for a steel type, and there was nothing we could catch due to the current weather. I did see some promising steel types in the next area, but they're also at too high a level, and even the bronzors in the first area are like level 30-something. This is brutal. However, we do find some good items though, like the Bulldoze TM, and... Oh, oh god, help me! Ugh, the leftovers too. Fantastic. Now let's get the f*** out of here. Traumatized and all alone, we arrive at our next destination, Motostoke. It looks like an industrial hellhole, so I try to leave immediately and... Okay, I'm not messing with a seven-foot-tall steel bird. Oh, hey, look! It's Ball Guy! Are you my real dad? Oh, great. Let's just make this day even better with the best evil team of all time, am I right? In the stadium, we get introduced to the gym leaders of the Gala region, and at this point it occurred to me, I've never played S.H.I.E.L.D. As I was like, oh yeah, version exclusive gym leaders. In the town, we can find two great items, being the silk scarf to boost our normal type moves, and also the black glasses to boost dark type moves. They're not going to help us right now though, as Hop challenges us to battle again, and I was actually pretty nervous for this battle, as we can't level up too high with only one Pokemon. He leads with his Wulu again, and this time I try to get more Hone Claws off, and I get five of them off, getting hit below half in the process, but again, our berry is a lifesaver as we can then smash him with Peck for the KO. His Sobble then outspeeds us with Water Gun of all things, and we survive on just 9 HP, but a plus 5 Peck doesn't even come close to taking him out. Uh-oh. I was sure it was all over here and was ready to reset, but he goes for Growl instead. Thank god we baited that with our attack raises, I guess, so we can smash him with one more. And then, a miracle happens here. We level up and learn Pluck, a stronger flying move, just as his last Pokémon comes out and it's enough to do the job and end the battle. Oh, way too scary for this early in game. The next route finally, finally gives us our first actual viable encounter. In the grass, we have a 9% chance to find none other than a Clink, which I catch and nickname TikTok. Alright, it's meant to be a Mario 64 reference. Chill out, Gen Zers. TikTok has a quirky neutral nature, and upon checking, I realized he already has electric moves. So the catching process was even more dangerous than I had realized. Up ahead, we have one of the more infamous parts of Sword and Shield, when Sonya shows you a crucial story element, this building, upon which the entire narrative rests, and turns out it's completely inaccessible throughout the entirety of the game. Nice. With a steel type finally in hand, I try to only use him for the trainer battles, which works out pretty well, although things like Sizzlipede getting critical hit embers certainly didn't help the process. We eventually make it to the Galar Mine, where we'll be able to get another encounter, a Drill Burr which I catch and nickname Wolverine. Wolverine has a sassy nature, plus special defense and minus speed. Minus speed on a future Excadrill is definitely terrible, but we'll take what we can get. In here, we can also find the Hardstone item to boost rock moves, before a realization sets in. Bead's battle up ahead is looking impossible for a Clink to handle alone. Now we have two options. Either I try to continually reset for a Hone Edge Max Raid Roll and Wild area which would make this battle easy, in which case this video gets delayed by X amount of days, or take the route almost all hardcore Nuzlockers do anyway and use a Pokemon that will get the specific type now, which I decide to do just this once. Thanks to the built-in XP share, we have Featherweight evolve into a Corvusquire, and now I'm hoping we can manage. Now, you wouldn't think Bead would be a scary battle for a Steel-type, but just watch. 
He leads with a Solosis, and I lead with TikTok. Vice Grip is our best move at the moment and does less than half, and then he uses Endeavor, which takes us below half already with Leftovers helping a bit. Another hit, then barely doesn't KO, then he hits a Confusion to bring us below half again before we can take him out on the next turn. If he had used Endeavor again there, yikes. Would have been much worse. In comes Gothita next, and we're kind of stuck doing the same thing as Psybeam does about 6 HP damage. He then gets a crit on the next one though, then lowers our attack with Tickle. In the end, we're brought to just 5 HP before Leftovers before taking that damn thing out. And here's the crucial moment. Clink can't stay in against Hatena, so I'm forced to switch all because of Endeavor. Featherway does fantastic here though, as I taught him Payback, which takes him down in two attacks after being brought right to half. Whew, really wish we had found a Hone Edge at this point. Leaving the cave, we arrive at Route 4, where we can finally catch another actual viable encounter, this time a Galarian Meowth. We catch it successfully and nickname him Todd, and Todd has a sassy plus special offense and minus speed nature too. Cool thing is, it has the Tough Claws ability to power up contact moves. Nice. I really wish we could get its hidden ability though, which would power up steel moves on our entire team. Would be pretty unreal. Here, we can also grab the Sharp Beak item to boost Featherweight's flying moves, but it will be a while before he evolves at level 38. With that, we finally arrive at the first gym location, Turfield. Now here at the Pokemon Center, we can take advantage of a great feature, the move reminder being in every one of them, and here we can have Meowth learn Priority Fake Out. With the Silk Scarf and Tough Claws boost, this should be pretty darn good. Oh god, I remember how much of a meme this thing was during the marketing cycle for this game. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but there's a weird puzzle in this town that involves touching different stones in a certain order, and if you do it correctly, you get an incredible item, the Expert Belt, before even the first gym. Amazing. Speaking of which, let's hit up the Turfield Gym. This is a Grass-type gym, a type that Steel has a resistance to, and Todd with our new Fake Out strat was incredible against the trainers. Oh, and my oh my, did we ever wrangle them Wooloo pretty darn well. It's time. The first gym leader, Milo, the Grass Expert, and because we're not Dynamaxing, I'm pretty nervous here. But let's see how we fare. He leads with a Gossifler, and I lead with Todd. Fake Out does about a third, and then I decide to go for Hone Claws to raise our attack before he uses Rapid Spin and gets a crit along with the Speed Boost. But we still outspeed amazingly and instantly take him out with Metal Claw. Let's go. But in comes his ace, Eldegoss, a fully evolved Pokemon and one that he Dynamaxes immediately. It goes for max overgrowth right away, and thanks to the resistance, it doesn't do all that much, but it does start grassy terrain to boost grass moves and restore health each turn. Metal Claw does surprisingly little, and now I'm feeling really nervous. With the terrain boost, his max overgrowth now does huge damage, but we survive on just 2 HP before hitting him again. Holy, that was close. I'm forced to switch, so I go into our last Pokemon, TikTok, and he went for Max Strike, thankfully, as the AI chooses a random move if any of them would KO. Clutch. After terrain and leftovers recovery, we get good health back, and his Dynamax finally ends. This was an utterly insane back and forth, but in the end, thanks to the terrain ending and our leftovers helping, we ended up taking him out with just 5 HP remaining. That was absurdly close, but we got the first badge. On the bridge up ahead, I got really excited about being able to use the bike and forgot that there was a battle with Hop at the end of it, but I think we've got a reasonable shot here. He leaves with Wulu, which now has super effective double kick of all things, but this was the weird part. He didn't end up using it. So Todd took him out, only taking a tackle. In comes Drizzile next though, and Water Pulse would hurt bad, so I switch into TikTok, who has the Expert Belt. Again, he only went for Round, Growl, and Bind here, so super effective Expert Belt boosted Charge Beam with the special attack boost from it took him down in three attacks. With all those power-ups now in effect, his newly evolved Corvusquire had no chance against Charge Beam either, and we win quite handily. I have no doubt he'll get tougher, but he kind of played whack there, not gonna lie. The gym towns come fast and furious now as we arrive in Holbury, quite a nice lakeshore city. While exploring, we can pick up the magnet to boost electric moves, and we also get the shell bell, which wouldn't be good if we didn't have leftovers already. In no time, we enter the Holbury City Gym. This is a water gym, which is a bit concerning as they resist all of our stab moves, but the way TikTok is set up is really helpful, even against Pokemon like Timpole with ground moves. The second gym leader is upon us, the water type specialist, Nessa, and her team, well, it looks terrifying for ours, but I think I theorycrafted reasonably well. She leads with a Goldeen, and I lead with TikTok. 
She hits a water pulse and I use charge to raise our special defense and increase the power of our next electric move too. My goal here is to raise our special defense as much as I can since that's mostly what her team uses, we just have to watch out for getting confused. I get two off before using Autotomize to raise our speed which is going to be crucial, but we miss charge beam on our next turn. Are you kidding me? Thankfully, the speed upgrade baits her into using agility, but then now she outspeeds again and uses water pulse and gets the confusion and we hit ourselves too. I have no words. We get brought below half, then get another autonomize off. Thankfully, we then break through confusion, but miss charge beam again. What the hell is going on? The next turn, we finally land one though, and it does a third, but we get the special attack boost. Another just barely doesn't KO on the next turn, and we ended up with 19 HP before leftovers before taking her out, but we got another boost too. In comes her Aracuda next, but after Autotomize, we outspeed it and smash it with a plus 3 charge beam for the instant KO, and get another boost too. In comes her final Pokemon, Dreadnought. Now here's the key. It Dynamaxes and has Swift Swim, but here we can outspeed and go for Discharge, an even stronger move which does a bit over half. It all depends if she goes for a special move here, which she usually does, and her special defense boost would allow us to survive, and we'd now outspeed even through rain, but she gets paralyzed from discharge anyway, so another attack KOs. Finally, our luck turned around after that ridiculous start. We saved ourselves from a nightmare with that one. In the second Galar mine up ahead, we encounter Beat again, but now we have a little something special for him. I taught Todd Payback, so he's able to obliterate every single one of his Pokemon, especially with the Expert Belt and the Double Power if we're hit first, and Todd's pretty slow. Amazing. Now in here, we can purposefully get our foot eaten in order to find our next encounter, a Galarian Stunfisk, which we catch and nickname Flapjack. Flapjack has a hasty nature, plus speed, and minus defense, which is meh. This thing does amazingly in the cave though, might have saved us actually, as there were some scary fire types, but part ground typing is much needed for our team. In here, we also grab the soft sand item to boost his moves even further. Exiting the cave, we get to the Motostoke outskirts where we can find yet another encounter, finally they're starting to pile up, a Ponyard, which I catch and nickname Cromwell, who ends up having a quirky neutral nature. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't evolve until all the way at level 52 for some reason, but we're gonna take what we can get. Up ahead, a new rival Marnie challenges us to battle, and a combination of Flapjack handling an otherwise scary fighting type Krogunk, and Ponyard rescuing us from Morpeko with Fury Cutter of all things saves the day. Now, on the face of it, the Motostoke Gym is looking like one of the most deadly things in the run for us, so I scoured the wild area for Watts and a Watt vendor who had a crucial TR, Earthquake, which the giant seat one did have, so an expensive 8,000 watts later and I could teach it to Flapjack. Thankfully, the gym itself has a different challenge where you can get through just by catching Pokemon, so it wasn't as dangerous as it could have been. Now, after what must have been an hour of theory crafting, the fire type gym leader Kapu's battle is looking near impossible, so I make sure to grab the Stealth Rock TR as well. With a last resort plan in mind, let's say a prayer. This might be a slaughter. Kabu leads with a Ninetales, and I send out Cromwell. Our number one priority here is Stealth Rock, which we get off after he missed his burn. He then hits one, but I attach to Rostberry, so we're healed immediately and hit him with Assurance for a quarter. This baits him into using it again, so we get another half-powered attack off at least. Ember then slams us hard, and we only get one more attack off to bring him below half, and we have no choice. We have nothing we can safely switch in, so it's time to say goodbye to Cromwell already. Here I send in TikTok, who gets burned off the bat, and in true TikTok fashion, we get the paralysis from discharge, but two of them don't even do enough as we're brought below a third already. He made it through paralysis, but missed fire spin, so we pull off the KO on Ninetales. However, in comes another massive threat, Arcanine with Intimidate too, but I'm glad Cromwell was out at least. Again, we can't dare switch out, so rest in peace to TikTok as well. This is brutal. Here, I send in Flapjack, hoping to bait the burn, and he does go for it, but I had another Rostberry which heals it, so our attack isn't lowered, and we land a stab super effective Earthquake after he got damaged by Stealth Rock, and it KOs. In comes his final Pokemon, his ace, Centiscorch, which Gigantamaxes, but is four times weak to Rock, so Stealth Rock brings him to half, which was super necessary. Gigantamax Centiscorch then hits us with G-Max Centiferno, but Flapjack survives it and lands a Bulldoze. Why not Earthquake, you might ask? To make sure we get enough power and drop its speed with Bulldoze, that way we can attack twice in a row, the second time with Earthquake, 
but he just barely survives on a sliver. Oh no. Flapjack then gets eviscerated right off the map. Ouch. I thought for sure that would do enough. Here, I have to send in our last Pokemon, Todd, who would die in one attack. But Priority Fakeout saves the day and wins us our third badge. That was ridiculously nerve-wracking, man oh man. With just one singular viable Pokemon left after that insanity, let's continue this crazy journey. Now thankfully with the third badge in hand, the wild area encounters open up just a bit as now we can go back to the giant seat to find a Bronzor, which we catch and nickname Libel. Todd apparently doesn't like the attention going anywhere else though, so after the catch he evolves into a beastly looking Perserker, which I haven't really used before, so I'm excited. Libel ends up having an impish nature, plus defense and minus special attack, and has levitate too. Quite amazing. Now I kid you not, in Bridgefield I spent an hour searching for our next encounter, a 5% chance as a random grass encounter, and finally we found it, a Pharaoh Seed, which I catch and nickname Nokia. Nokia has a mild plus special attack and minus defense nature, which is pretty atrocious, not gonna lie. Up ahead, I got all excited thinking we could get some awesome stuff from the digging duo, and he begins to dig and... Bruh. Arrival in Hammerlock is a brief trip given that the gym here is a later one, but we can get a couple great items like Focus Sash and the Muscle Band too, which increases power of all physical moves by 10%. Great for our team. Ahead on Route 6, we can grab the Dig TM, and also an item I think might be crucial for us later, the Light Clay. One of the trainers here though had a damn throw that I wasn't expecting that nearly ended our whole team, but Libel saved us and deservedly evolved afterwards into a beastly Bronzong adding a great defensive presence to our team for probably the first time ever. Turns out Wolverine doesn't want to miss out and evolves as well into a wicked Excadrill, finally making him usable. Alright, I must say, it feels very wrong being able to hit a coughing with a ground-type move. Coughing without levitate is like a Canadian without a hole in his head for living in a frigid wasteland of- Another 5% encounter search goes a little bit better than last time as we did get a great new team member, a Durant, which I catch and nickname Kevin. Kevin has a timid nature plus speed and minus attack. Half good, half terrible. With that, we arrive in Stowonside, a quaint village that really reminds me a lot of Kakariko Village from Twilight Princess now that I think about it. Alright Libel, enough fooling around, we've got a job to do. The village nets us some fantastic items like the Metal Coat to boost our steel moves, and also the Rocky Helmet I think we'll make some good use of. Before the gym, Hop challenges us again, and with a good variety of team members now, we have Wolverine take down his Cramorant with Expert Bell Rock Slide, Libel took care of his Silicobra's ground typing with Levitate of course, then was able to put Drizzile to sleep with Hypnosis in preparation for Nokia to take it down with Iron Barbs and Rocky Helmet combo, then Toxel was devastated with a four times super effective stab expert belt 80 power dig. Might have been a bit overkill Wolverine. Up next is a gym I've never done before, the Stow Inside gym, well particularly in its ghost form in Shield, which has a pretty fun puzzle element to it. Todd with the expert belt and payback absolutely blew through the trainers, especially if he got outsped first to double his power, and in no time we arrive at the fourth gym leader, Alistair, who... Well, who knows what the hell's going on with that guy. He leaves with a Yaw Mask, and I decide to go in with Kevin, who learned Crunch recently, so it instantly KOs Yaw Mask in one hit with the Black Glasses item, but does get rid of Hustle, which raises attack at the expense of accuracy. Ursula suffers the same fate, and in comes Mimikyu next. It uses Baby Doll Eyes to lower our attack, then we hit a Crunch to get rid of its disguise. Now, what we do here is kind of funny. I continually switch between Durant and Perserker until the very moment he doesn't lower the latter's attack, then we can KO him with Iron Head after a Hone Claws boosted Shadow Sneak for not much damage. His final Pokemon is Gengar, which instantly Gigantamaxes, and thankfully he has like no coverage against Steel type, so after a max Darkness hits, we can slam him with Double Power Expert Belt Payback for the instant one hit KO and the win. Pretty solid. After smashing the hell out of a mural with a giant metal elephant for whatever reason, B challenges us to battle, and here I realized Kevin is the perfect counter, having stabbed super effective expert belt coverage against his entire team, although Hustle did make us miss our attacks quite a few times, so we got brought to a third in the process. A trip through the beautiful Glimwood Tangle then brings us to the next gym destination, Balanly, the mystical forest town. Picking up the Eviolite for Nokia to use temporarily and the Revenge TM, it's time to hit up the gym. Against the fairy types in here, Libel was incredible with Heavy Slam, pretty much devastating everything as they're all quite light Pokemon comparatively. 
Along the way, we have a long-awaited evolution as Featherweight evolves into a Corviknight, officially making it usable. The fifth gym leader is Opal, and I think we have a devious plan for this battle. She leads with a Galarian Weezing, and I lead with Featherweight. You see, her Weezing has absolutely no way to do, like, any damage on us, so she's basically setup fodder as we can load up on Hone Claws, which also helps to bring her accuracy to 100, which was the only risk here, and Featherweight absolutely sweeps through her entire team with Stab Super Effective Steel Wing, even through her Mawile's Intimidate and her Gigantamax 2. What a legend. Not a bad first impression. Okay, second. <laughs> what is going on here? She's going to train him how to grow a nose. <laughs> Before moving on, I make sure to pick up the light screen and reflect TMs from the Pokemon Center in Hammerlock. And since I know we're going to have a tough battle ahead, I train Nokia to level 40 where he evolves into a monstrous Ferrothorn, which also learns power up upon evolution, giving us some really great coverage against threatening ground types. Now, on Route 7, I accidentally looked at the wrong team for Hop Online, so I had no idea what I was doing. But thankfully, the level discrepancy was quite substantial at this point, so Payback handled Trevenant, which couldn't really hurt us. Then Wolverine tanked a Fire Lash from Heatmore to thankfully one-hit KO it with Dig. We now have a fully evolved Nokia to handle Inteleon with Power Whip, and also his Snorlax, which didn't take to Iron Barbs combined with Iron Head too well. Let's go. Here we can grab a new encounter too, another 5% Pokemon, when will it end? A Carablast, which I catch and nickname Galahad. He does have a great jolly nature too, but Durant is definitely the better bug steel type, and we have a full team already, so we'll keep this thing in the box as backup. On Route 8, we can grab the Smart Strike TM, great as a more powerful Metal Claw alternative, and here we can also get another encounter, a Togedemaru, which we catch and nickname Knuckles. Togedemaru. Knuckles has a gentle, plus special defense and minus defense nature, not fantastic, and I'm going to have him replace Wolverine on the team for now, as he also learns Zing Zap. With that, we arrive in the serene Churchester town. And in one of the hotels, we can out a criminal Squovit to get awarded with the wide lens to increase accuracy, which is perfect to offset Kevin's hustle ability. The Churchester gym is upon us, and, well, it's straight up annoying. And yet again, Libel put in some work against the ice trainers with Heavy Slam. The gym leader, though, Melanie, is definitely looking like more of a challenge, so I make sure to find and teach the Ironhead TM to Kevin before challenging her. Huh. So this is the gym leader everyone was thirsty beyond belief about. She leads with a Frosamoth, and I send out Kevin for the immediate Ironhead KO. In comes a big threat though, Darmanitan, which has 4 times super effective Fire Fang. We just have to hope we outspeed and hit here, and we do. Crisis averted. In comes Ice Q next, and this thing is incredibly annoying with its Ice Face ability, but I switch in Libel and... Oh god, I forgot the crux of my whole plan. Light screen. Whoops. It's a long struggle with extra sensory, but I need it to bypass Ice Face. Eventually, with her in the red, I use Hypnosis, then switch into Knuckles to activate my plan as the hail stops. I go for Fell Stinger to break Ice Face, but then she wakes up and starts the hail again, which also activates Ice Face yet again. Ugh. Eventually, we finally get one off, and Felstinger raises your attack if you get a KO with it, which is perfect leading into her ace, Gigantamax Lapras. And with plus one attack, Expert Belt Boosted, Stab Super Effective Zing Zap, we're able to smash it in one hit. Tough to pull off, but that plan worked pretty well. Now, Sonya invited us to lunch at the local restaurant, and yeah, having this thing here definitely makes me want to come here to eat. Now, Hop's battle here went pretty much the same way as last time, with the difference being I could use Knuckles to handle his Corviknight incredibly well, and also brought Wolverine back on the team to handle his Pinchurchin, which can be quite a nuisance. Marnie then challenges us to battle ahead of the next town, and I'm really liking our team synergy now. As Kevin handles Lipard with ease, then bringing Featherweight back on allowed us to take down Scrafty, then Wolverine was a great answer to her more Pico, which has caused us problems, and also outspan and slammed her Toxicroak with Dig, too. That win grants us access to Spike Muth where the next gym is, and a complete hallway of a town. Cool theme, at least. I make sure to teach Libel Reflect before heading in to challenge the seventh gym leader, the Dark Trainer, Pierce. He leaves with a Scrafty, and I send out Libel. My whole plan here was to put him to sleep, being careful of his payback, and then get Reflect up before switching into Featherweight, but unfortunately he woke up and broke the Reflect with Brick Break before Drill Peck annihilated him with a crit. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Malamar then comes out, and I switch into Kevin, who gets hit with Night Slash, but no crit, then 4 times damage X-Scissor took him out. 
In comes the big threat, Obstagoon, which has massive defense and attack, so staying in is not a good idea. I switch into Nokia instead, and he just went for Obstruct as I thought, so Iron Barbs and Iron Head did a number on him. I was hoping to bait the counter here, so I switch into Kevin again, but he went for Throat Chop, but we survive and can take him out from this range with Excisor. Skuntank is his last Pokemon, and Wolverine is a perfect switch here, tanking Snarl with ease and responding with a Dig KO for our 7th badge. Before we move on, I have some bad news, everyone. Todd was murdered by the champion himself. <laughs> it's time for the final gym, the Hammerlock Gym. The traders were all double battles, but luckily you can take a break between each battle so we could adjust our team to perform the best against each duo, and in no time we'd make it to the final stadium. Before anything, I made sure to get another Earthquake TR to teach Wolverine, as I think we're gonna need it. I theorycrafted like crazy for Raihan's battle, and there was no surefire strategy, but with our best plan in place, let's go for it. He leaves with a Gigalith and Flygon with Levitate, so I leave with Wolverine and Libel, our own Levitate Pokemon. Now what's amazing is Wolverine's attack gets boosted by his Sandstorm with the Sand Force ability. His Flygon hit Libel hard with Crunch, then I go for Earthquake just to take down Gigalith. I then have Libel use a Reflect with the Light Clay Boost, then in comes Sandaconda which has Fire Fang. Crunch hits Libel for not much damage now with Reflect up, and Smart Strike hits Flygon low, but then Sandaconda uses Glare on Wolverine. Uh oh. I was not expecting that when he had super effective coverage on us. Flygon then goes down to Heavy Slam though, and in comes Duraludon which promptly Gigantamaxes. Oh boy. Max Knuckle hits Wolverine and raises Duraludon's attack, then Fire Fang hits Lie Below and gets the burn. We land a Sand Force Earthquake to take them both below half though, and Extra Sensory just barely doesn't take out his Sandaconda. Damn. With both our Pokemon hurt bad and status, I have to commit to it. The double switch. I send out Featherweight and Todd, and he raises their attack with Max Knuckle again, but my plan works as Sandaconda targeted the right side with Fire Fang, and Rocky Helmet Recoil took it out. Amazing. From there though, I have no choice since he outspeeds, and he does take down Todd with Max Knuckle. Then our revenge takes him to the red. Todd's sacrifice comes in clutch though, as his Dynamax ends and Body Press now doesn't do much, so another attack takes him down for our 8th and final badge. That Todd sacrifice was unfortunate, but the battle could have gone a lot worse. Well, now we can finally get the stronger Pokemon in the wild area, so in the Giant's Mirror, I find and catch a Beastly Steelix, which I nicknamed Behemoth, who has a mild plus special attack and minus defense nature. Excadrill's definitely the better option, so we'll box him for now. We also get access to the Lake of Outrage now, where we can pick up the Assault Vest, and unfortunately the weather doesn't allow us to get a Dublade. Regardless, a long trip has us arrive in the final city, Winden, where the Champions Cup will be held, so it's off to the stadium. Once the opening ceremonies have concluded, I head back to Route 10 to search for the 1% encounter Duraludon, and after a while it finally appears, giving us quite a cool Pokemon which I nicknamed Titan, and who has a not great careful plus special defense and minus special attack nature. With that, it's time for the Champions Cup. Our first semi-final match is against Marnie, and she leaves with her Lipard, and I tried to use Taunt on it to prevent it from using Torment, and it worked after she used Nasty Plot. This allowed me to get two Hone Claws off, not as much as I was expecting, then I could take out her Lipard in one Drill Peck, her Morpico in two with us being brought to the red before leftovers, then her Scrafty went down in one as well, then knowing her Toxicroak would try either a Sucker Punch or Swagger, I used Taunt, and it worked so she couldn't confuse us, and Drill Pack takes her down with their leftovers bringing us out of the red. In comes her final Pokemon, Grimmsnarl, which immediately Gigantamaxes, and I think I got overconfident as I thought a plus two stab super effective Steel Wing would do the job, but she barely survives in the red and slams us with a G-Max Snooze, which would have been dangerous to switch into anyway, so Featherweight goes down. From there though, Kevin handles her with an Iron Head to win the battle. Next up is our final battle with Hop, and I decide to send in Kevin first to take down both his double and his Snorlax with Iron Heads, with us being brought to two-thirds. Pinchurchin was then an easy switch into Wolverine for the Earthquake one-hit KO, even after he used Curse to raise his defense, and Corviknight was again handled by Knuckles. However, in comes his final Pokemon, Inteleon, which Dynamaxes this time. Now as you can probably see, I almost clicked Zing Zap, but at the last second realized this thing's gonna have four times super effective Max Quake. Sheesh. 
So I switched into Libel, who's immune with Levitate, then switched into Nokia to tank the incoming Max Darkness, and with lowered special defense now, I did another double pivot between them to stall out Dynamax and reset our special defense. But he flinches us with Dark Pulse, but I have no choice, so I have to stay in, and we survive on just 19 HP to make it through for the Power Whip KO. Whew. A long trip to the top of the battle tower brings us to Oleana, who has become an absolute psycho, and her team was quite well managed by Kevin taking out her Frostlass with Iron Head and her Salazzle with 4 times damage Dig. Then I could switch into Ferrothorn to handle her Milotic, and to stall out and take down her Sarina, which couldn't do much against us. Her final Pokemon is Garbodor, which Gigantamaxes, but Libel is a complete counter to it in every way and wears it down with extra sensory. Before the finals, Beat interrupts and challenges us to one last battle, and with his Mawile with Intimidate, it was a bit tricky, but my plan was to send out Wolverine and get a Swords Dance off to negate it, then hit it with an Earthquake for the KO, then Gardevoir, Galarian Rapidash, and Gigantamax Hatterene were all super effective KOs with Smart Strike. What a legend. With that out of the way, the finals are now upon us, and our first challenge is Nessa, the Water Gym Leader. She has a tricky lead, Galissapod, so I send out Libel and get the Reflect off right away with Light Clay for extended duration. I then switch into Knuckles, who tanks Shadow Claw and gets the Iron Barb recoil on him. Then Zingzap hits him low and activates his emergency exit so he can attack, bringing in Barrascuta. This thing outspeeds us and has a ground type move, so I send Libel out again, who's immune. With Reflect up, Throat Chop now doesn't do too much, so two extra sensories do the job with us at a third. Galissapod comes back out now, so I send in Nokia, but she full restores. Wasn't anticipating that, to be honest. Here I send out Knuckles again, as she goes for Swords Dance, but no problem, as we can activate Emergency Exit with Zing Zap again. Sea King is an instant Expert Bell KO with Zing Zap, and now I can activate my plan. Using Electric Terrain to boost Electric moves, and having her hurt herself on Iron Barbs with us in the red, then I use Fell Stinger to take her down and get the boost from the KO. Now, with plus one attack, the Expert Belt, Electric Terrain, super effective damage, and stab, we can now absolutely pulverize her Pelipper and Gigantamax Dreadnought, since it only has Shell Armor now. Incredible. Alistair is up next, and for him, I attached the Expert Belt on Kevin and went to work with Crunch, but I needed the extra damage, so I had no Wide Lens. We just needed to make sure that we didn't miss on Chandelure, because that would be really bad, and we didn't, and it doesn't have Flame Body either, so no burn was possible. Ultigeist only got a nasty plot off before going down, and then in came Gigantamax Gengar. I go for Crunch, and we miss, and he hits a Max Darkness, but we survive on just 3 HP, but then we miss again, and he KOs us. Are you absolutely kidding me? We just needed one hit. From there though, Wolverine could get the job done with super effective Earthquake since Gengar doesn't have Levitate anymore. Looking ahead to our final battle before the champion against Raihan, I know we need more, so I made sure to get an Earthquake TR for Steelix, who is now joining our team, and got the Dragon Pulse TR for Duraludon too. Let's see what we can do. In a single battle, I thought this would be much more manageable, as Raihan leads with Torkoal and I send out Duraludon. Dragon Pulse does over half, then Sunboosted Lava Plume slams us hard below half too before we can take him down on the next turn. In comes Flygon next, and alright, I thought we'd outspeed here, but we didn't, but he just went for Sandstorm. Holy, thank goodness, that was way too close, as now Expert Belt Dragon Pulse annihilates him. Turtonator then suffers the same fate as Titan is a beast, and Gudra does survive one, but has no significant way to hurt us, so I felt safe staying in, and he just went for Rain Dance, so another gets the job done. In comes his final Pokemon, though, his own Duraludon, except his can Gigantamax. Not fair. Here I switch into Libel, who walls off all his attacks quite well, except his attack is raised by Max Knuckle as he lands two in a row before we get a Reflect up. Another hit brings his attack up hugely, but we land a Hypnosis and successfully stalled him through Dynamax, so I can switch in our new team member, Behemoth, who smashes him with Earthquake, but it doesn't quite KO. He then full restores, another hits him to the red, then Body Press hardly touches us at all before we KO for the win. Behemoth, you monster. After the battle in the lobby, Hop debates whether he should cheer for us, his rival, or Leon. What? He's your f***ing brother! Even your own Inteleon's not impressed by your antics. Right before the champion battle, the crowd goes nuts and everyone starts screaming about what's on the screen. My dudes, that's just like the standard League logo, what's the problem? 
Turns out Mr. President was hatching some giant monster eggs beneath the city, so we have to destroy him. He is our Steel-type arch nemesis, and he leads with an Escavalier, so I lead with Wolverine. Drill Run hits us hard and has a high critical hit ratio, but no crit, so we survive, although I had attached a Focus Sash anyway, so we were safe no matter what. From here, we can sweep through his entire team with plus two stab Earthquake, although his Clank Clang outsped us surprisingly, but even from that range had nothing that could take us out, although it was pretty close. Also, never before has something been so simultaneously cool and ridiculous as Gigantamax Copperaja. Just saying. At the conclusion of the battle, the energy-stealing Pokemon, or something, Eternatus emerges and... Alright, this dude really just used a regular Pokeball to try and save the world? Thankfully, we survived through the Eternamax Eternatus battle with some close calls, but the Wolf Boys pulled us through. It's time for the final battle, the unbeatable champion, Leon, and his team is a nightmare for us. I theorycrafted for a long damn time for this one, but without any further ado, let's just give it our best shot. The goal here? Survive. Leon leads with an Aegislash, and I lead with our trusty Wolverine. I taught him Stealth Rock, as I know that's going to be absolutely crucial, and he slams us with Sacred Sword to the red immediately. From here, though, we can take him down with Earthquake. However, in comes a huge threat, Cinderace, and this was the thing I tried to prepare for for so long. Nothing on our team can handle a switch into this thing since it outspeeds everything, so... It's time to say goodbye to Wolverine. Here, I send in Behemoth, and he goes for Pyro Ball again, and it smashes even a Steelix below half, and gets the burn. Oh no, no way! Now our Earthquake doesn't KO. This is not good. After he full restores, another brings him below half, and he goes for Pyro Ball, but misses so we can take him down. Serves him right. That luck was perfectly balanced, as all things should be. In comes another beast of his team, Haxorus. Since it has Mold Breaker, Earthquake would hit even Bronzong, so I have to let Behemoth go. Now I send in Libel here, and he goes for Outrage. Interesting. This allows me to get up the Reflect, and we tank the Outrage as well, so I hit a Gyro Ball to about half. He hits us to half, and then gets confused, and Gyro Ball brings him low. On this turn, I went for Light Screen after he hit us to prepare for his later Pokémon, then he got a crit, but we survived on just 6 HP to take him down with a final attack. In comes Seismitoad next, and, well, our goal is to just win the battle, so sacrifices must be made to keep us safe as Libel goes down. Thankfully, we have a perfect counter here as I send Nokia out, and we tank Drain Punch well and respond with a 4 times damage Power Whip for the instant one-hit KO. In comes another huge threat, Dragapult, which has 4 times super effective Flamethrower, but with the light screen up, Nokia survives with just above half, and because Dragapult is so fast, it gets slammed hard with Gyro Ball, and we survive another in the red before actually being able to take it down. However, in comes Leon's final Pokémon, the biggest threat to our team even after all we've seen so far, is Charizard, which Gigantamaxes. Oh boy, this is terrifying. When theorycrafting for this, I saw almost no path to victory, but the Stealth Rocks are four times effective and hurt him all the way to half before he decimates Nokia. With just two Pokémon left, this is looking scary. But it's time to put my plan into action. I send out Knuckles, and go for Spiky Shield, which is like Protect, and this way we only take a small fraction of the damage. However, Light Screen then wears off, and he smashes us again for the KO. It's time. Just one Pokémon remaining on either side as we send out Titan. Now, if I'm honest, I ran the calcs, and Duraludon has 157 speed, whereas Charizard is supposed to have 155, so we should definitely outspeed here, but we don't, and he connects a Fire Blast. But Titan survives just in the red and responds with an Expert Belt Thunderbolt for the win. Unbelievable. I can't believe we actually managed that. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield with only Steel types and with no Dynamaxing. We had a wicked variety of Pokemon and 11 total deaths, but I think we played pretty darn well regardless, and it was super fun to work with some new mods. I hope you had fun with the run, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoy, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.